Welcome to Shoot the Video, a brand new series which explains how you can make your own television and get the best from your camcorder. Making videos is one of the fastest growing hobbies and whether you want to spend £500 or £1,500, there's equipment to suit your pocket. Shops like this are doing fantastic business and there's an overwhelming choice of formats, of manufacturers, of accessories, even magazines on the subject. But it really doesn't matter how simple or sophisticated your equipment is or what format you choose because there are a few simple techniques which can be applied to all video making. And that's what this series is all about. The grammar, if you like, of making videos. These are rules that all professional filmmakers use. Hitchcock, Spielberg, all of them. And they are what makes the difference between a video that looks amateurish and one that everyone will want to watch. As soon as you pick up a camcorder, turn it on and shoot, you become a director. I mean, think about it. Your home videos are, in fact, television programs, and because you decide what to shoot and how to shoot it, you are doing exactly the same job as a professional TV director does. And believe me, the principles we're talking about are surprisingly simple and fun. Let's go and shoot some video. Welcome to Mallorca. One of the most popular uses of a camcorder is recording a holiday. Video really is the perfect medium for capturing the sights and sounds of exotic locations. Leaps in technology have made this possible. Television was first unveiled to the public less than 70 years ago. In those days, the cameras literally weighed a ton. Color television was still a novelty just 20 years ago. But nowadays, this little box of tricks can record pictures and sound of remarkable quality. Camcorders are probably the most complicated pieces of equipment in any household, combining precision mechanics, electronics, and computer chips. This is a camcorder without its cover, and as you can see, it's very complex. Most people aren't particularly interested in how the things actually work. But it is worth remembering that they are very sophisticated machines which can give excellent results. They aren't exactly cheap either, and it seems a terrible waste when so many home videos look and sound like this. Dear, oh dear. Now, one of the biggest causes of that awful sort of seasickness is overuse of the zoom lens. Now, Scott's got one on his camera. Scott, I know this goes against your better nature, but show me the sort of zooming that you would never put in a professional production that met your normally very high standards. That's enough. I'm beginning to feel a bit queasy already. You see what I mean? It's horrible, isn't it? Now, most cameras, in fact, all of them these days, have a zoom control. It's a little rocker switch like that. Uh, it's very sophisticated and it's very clever and it could magnify the image six times and even more. And if you use it properly, the effect can be very good. There's a church on the hill over there. I'm going to get a picture of that and zoom into it now. The thing is, because the zoom lens is there and because it's so incredibly powerful, People feel they have to use it all the time, but beware, because if you do, you could get results a bit like this. This is what's generally known as a trombone or yo-yo shot, with the camera zooming in and out for no particular reason. Compare these two sequences. In the first, we have a succession of zooms with the pictures cutting before we've had time to focus on the subject. In the second sequence, the zoom was used to bring us close to the subject, but the zoom itself wasn't recorded. That way, we get a succession of good close-up shots, which are more pleasant to watch. If you think about the films and television programmes you've seen, you probably notice that you hardly ever see a zoom going on while you're watching. Now you know why. The reason for the zoom being there really is, uh, to use the jargon phrase, to use as a cropping tool. In other words, to set up a shot and get it really nicely framed before you record it. If you really do want to use the zoom in vision, then why not try zooming out instead of in? Two advantages to that. One is that when you're zoomed in tight, you could check that the focus is nice and sharp. And the other is that as you pull back, as you zoom out, you can reveal to the viewer part of the scene that they haven't seen before. It's quite nice. I'll show you what I mean.
One common failing among beginners, and we're all guilty of this, is called hose piping. It's where you point the camera and then you kind of spray it around like a hose pipe. The problem, of course, is that you end up with material you probably won't use. It's the lightness of this modern equipment. It makes it very easy to do. But the pan is a very useful shot. And I'll show you a trick with the pan, which I think you find useful. The trick is to start with a subject, a really attractive picture, and end with another picture, which is just as attractive. You start, oddly enough, at the end. You face the picture you're going to end with. It's the church, in fact, up on the hill over there. Get a nice framing of that, and then you sort of it's almost like conning up a spring. You twist your body, keeping your legs in the same position, slightly apart, elbows on your chest, hold the camera firmly, frame up on your opening shot, start the camera running, hold on that because you might use that as a single shot without the pan in between, and then uncoil the spring slowly and as steadily as you possibly can. There are the hills and the terraces and the olive groves, and you end up with the end shot of the church, and you get nice and steady on that, and then you stop the camera. And that's the pan. Very useful shot. Well, you don't get scenery like this at home, do you? And a shot like this is very useful to establish where you are. In fact, the pros use it. Television and films use establishing shots to show where you are at the beginning of a sequence. And in fact, we used a sequence of establishing shots earlier in this program to take us from the shop to the hotel. Let's have a look at that sequence again. Let's go and shoot some video. Welcome to Mallorca. See what I mean? And I'm going to do exactly the same thing now in my holiday video to establish where we are. I'm going to start on that hillside and then pan around to the town to a shot which includes the cathedral. Interesting thing about pans, because we read from left to right, it means that our brains are set up to logically read pans from left to right. So the convention is to pan from left to right as often as you possibly can. Here we go. Well, that's the establishing wide shot. In fact, I'm going to the cathedral next, and that's the next thing I'm going to film. And quite a good piece of film grammar is to use a zoom shot of the cathedral to take us there. And I forgot my tripod, so use anything that's close to hand, really. This will do. Nice wall. There we are. And there's the cathedral and a slow zoom in. Another popular moving shot is the tilt, which is exactly the same as a pan, except that it's up and down. And it's a very useful shot for giving an impression of size or height or steepness. You can use it with the cathedral, as I have just done, or you can use it for a cliff or a canyon, that sort of thing. And now I can show you the whole of the sequence we've shot so far, which ends up with us right here in the cathedral square. We've seen some of the basic moves of a camcorder, but what about the other ingredient of your video, the tape itself? Tape is, of course, the medium onto which you record, store, and play back your pictures and sound. And it comes in many shapes and sizes, depending on the format of your camcorder. This program is being recorded on tape using one of these. And almost every pre-recorded television program is edited onto and transmitted from a one-inch tape like this one. In fact, even feature films are transferred onto tape before they're shown on television. It's worth sticking to well-known brands. Unlike audio tape, there's no grading system for videotape, so tapes have some fancy-sounding but totally meaningless names like Mega Grade or Extra Fine. Fortunately, the camcorder tape market hasn't been invaded by the cheap manufacturers like the ordinary VHS market, so the best advice is to stick to the well-known brand names. Cheap tape really is a false economy. It can dirty your machine by scratching the video and audio heads, and it can shed its oxide coating. Besides, it simply doesn't record pictures and sound as well. 
always look after your tapes properly. Keep them in boxes, standing upright and away from direct sunlight or strong magnets like the ones in loudspeakers. Right, let's get back to my holiday video. All I've shot so far is scenery, which is fine, as it establishes that I'm somewhere different, but people's faces and close-up objects make much more interesting pictures. They'll give the video some atmosphere. So, let's see what we can find. Now this is absolutely ideal, a lovely old 1920s tram. It's going to take us through all the back streets of Soya and then it's going to take us on the two and a half mile journey through the orange groves to the new port. Perfect opportunity to film the journey. Now, once we get going, it's going to move around and rattle around a bit and that, uh, that means you've really got to find a trick somewhere, something firm to lean up against, like a, a doorway or a, you know, one of these sort of metal posts or something would be ideal for that and that's what I'm going to try to do now. As we get started, off we go, the bell's gone. Isn't this great? This is the kind of public transport system we're going to have all over Britain. With a bit of luck, tramways running down the streets. Now then, if it looks as if I've been filming solidly all the way through this program, it's not true. I've been having a darn good holiday as well, and it's very important to get this video lark into perspective. In fact, if you're still uncertain as to whether you really want to have one of these video cameras or not, the answer is to hire one for a few days or take one on holiday. You'll know straight away whether you're going to take to it or not. If you do get bitten by the bug, you're immediately going to be bombarded with a bewildering choice of accessories. Some are necessary, some are simply luxuries. This, in our view, is a necessity. A good, strong, waterproof bag to keep the thing in. I mean, it's a big investment you're making, so 70 pounds for a bag seems a reasonable kind of protection, sort of insurance, if you like. Well worthwhile. Another absolute necessity, in our view, is spare batteries. Take a good few of these, because they always run out at the wrong time, so you can always keep some freshly charged ones with you. Another necessity, we reckon, is a tripod because it is by miles the best way of getting really steady panning and tilting shots. If you don't want to be cluttered up with something quite as big as that, there's a, a lighter, smaller, cheaper alternative. It's called a monopod, one-legged tripod, if you like. And it's nearly as good, and you can get some remarkably steady shots with it. Luxuries now. Here's one we like. That, believe it or not, is a projector. So if you're in a hotel room, there's no television, all you've got to do is plug a feed from your camera into those sockets, plug it in, or put the battery on, point it at the wall, and you get a picture and sound comes through the loudspeaker. That's terrific. That's for reviewing your day's shooting. Another luxury is this, which is a waterproof camera housing. It'll go down to 30 feet underwater. It's great for a day on the beach, or if you want to go snorkeling or scuba diving. Um, it has a an optical glass front so that the lens can look out through there. Perfectly safe. The only drawback, of course, is it's 150 pounds. Cheaper fun can be got from filters. Actually, one filter is a very practical thing. This is uh, a polarizing filter, in fact. Um, you can have a daylight filter as well if you want to. It's well worthwhile putting that on the front of the lens of your camera and leaving it there permanently, because not only does it give you slightly better pictures in bright sunlight, but it protects the lens of the camera at the same time. Or there are the fun filters. They're used by professionals all the time. Look, there's a graded filter in here somewhere. I have a red one. All sorts of effects can be got with all hundreds and hundreds of different kinds of filters. In fact, we put together a sequence just to show you how versatile they are. Filters.
going to end my holiday video with a corny old cliché. A sunset never fails. I found a spot that faces west, and while I'm waiting, I'm going to tell you about Iris. No, not my holiday fling. All cameras have an iris which controls the amount of light which gets in through the lens. It's very similar to the human eye. In a bright light, the aperture gets smaller, and when it's darker, the iris opens up. Just like a human eye, camcorders open and close automatically. But camcorders aren't quite as clever. They measure the light in the middle of the frame. So if, for example, you're taking a shot of someone against a bright background, provided they're in the middle, they'll be properly exposed. But I've asked our cameraman, Scott, to switch to automatic, and if he pans so that I'm off-centre, the camera measures the light of the background, which is now in the middle of the frame, and I become almost a silhouette. Now, Scott could control manually the aperture, and most camcorders have the same facility. Manual override or backlight compensation is called on this one. It's very useful for these kind of conditions. I'm going to try and get my sunset shot now. A second ago, I was filming a sunset in the Mediterranean, and now here I am back in the air-conditioned splendor of this studio. You accept what you've just seen without wondering how I got back or how long it took, and that illustrates the power of editing, which is what we're going to have a look at now. Many people are worried by editing, the various complicated sounding terms, offline, time code, audio dubbing, and so on. In reality, editing is just another word for copying pictures and sound from one tape to another. Somebody once said, art is life without the boring bits. If you've ever had to sit through other people's home videos, you'll know just how boring they can be. Editing or copying your home videos allows you to leave out the boring bits, mistakes, like this classic one where I left the camcorder on and recorded half an hour of my feet. And even when I put the camcorder back in my bag, with the tape still running. Of course, when you copy material from one tape to another, you don't have to copy it the same order as you filmed it. Most films and television programs are shot completely out of sequence and then edited into the right order to make sense. And the same applies to home videos. There are a number of different ways you can edit or copy your programs. The simplest is to connect your camcorder direct to your VCR. You simply record the bits you want straight from one into the other. At the other extreme, you can get equipment like this, an edit controller, vision mixer and an audio dubber and they're essentially home versions of equipment which you find in a professional editing studio like the one I'm sitting in now. They can do amazing things but they also cost as much as if not a lot more than your camcorder. But editing anyway is all about rhythm and pace and making sense of a story. The fancy equipment simply helps you achieve the professional looking results more easily. The basic rules of editing, like the basic grammar of making videos, still apply, no matter how so simple or sophisticated the equipment is. I've come back from my holiday with approximately two hours of material, which I now want to edit into something more manageable. And for the purposes of this program, I'm going to edit it into a three-minute film. Remember that a short film which leaves the audience wanting more is infinitely preferable to one which has them glancing at their watches all the time, wondering where the damn thing's going to end. Have a look at what I've done, and at various points throughout the tape, I'll stop it and explain some of the editing tricks you can use. Because it's a holiday video, I started with a couple of establishing shots of Heathrow Airport to indicate that I was traveling abroad, and then followed it with a sequence of my airplane taking off. Now, that sequence is a very good example of an editing cheat. Now, obviously, I needed two airplanes taking off to film that sequence, one which I filmed from the observation area of the terminal building, actually at the airport, and one which I filmed from inside the plane. But by cutting them together carefully, it looks as if it's the same plane taking off. But have a look at that sequence again, and this time not edited so carefully, and you'll see what I mean about editing being all about rhythm and pace and feeling natural.
See what I mean? That sequence was completely wrong. The plane appeared to take off twice, and the shots taken from inside the plane didn't match the shots taken from outside. Now let's carry on. Having started my holiday video with a few shots of the airport, you'll remember that I got an establishing panning shot of the mountains and the valley and followed it with a slow zoom into Soyer Cathedral. This shot, if you like, takes us into the town, and the tilt down brings us into the square itself, where I got a few close-up shots of people. Now, those were all tight close-up shots, but see how messy it would look if we included the zoom as well. Now, that sequence of shots isn't as comfortable to watch, and it proves that the zoom really should be used sparingly. Most of the time, it should really only be used to frame shots before you shoot them. The next part of my holiday video is going to be a sequence with the tram, and I'm going to start, as usual, with an establishing shot, and follow it with a sequence of shots taken from the tram itself. See what you make of it. Having arrived at the port, I decided to look around, but I made the big mistake of wandering around aimlessly with the camcorder switched on. As a result, you're much more aware of the cameraman than you are of what's going on in the picture. And all these shots are really pretty dreadful. There should always be a good reason to move the camera, otherwise your shots can look very amateurish, like these ones. Now this is a classic error. I zoomed in on the boat. The autofocus goes completely mad, and as I follow the boat, another boat gets in the way. But instead of switching off, I just kept on filming, hoping to retrieve the situation. But of course, to no avail. That's all we've got time for this week, but we've made a start looking at the basic techniques of filming and editing. In the next programme, we'll film a wedding, talk about composition and framing, and look at the importance of making good sound recordings. We'll end this program with some better shots of the harbour and we'll roll the credits over that fabulous sunset. <laughs>